Hey there. What up, peeps? How's everyone doing today? Well, I decided to discuss a little topic of fixing old stuff. And uh, I'm not sure where to start. This is kind of off the cuff here, but I really wanted to just share this knife I had restored. This has been an ongoing process over several decades. This was my grandfather's knife from World War II. It's a battle knife. Uh, and I built this sheath for it just last year out of leather. I am not a leather worker, mind you. Uh, I only had a needle and thread back then, so I've since then got some more leather working tools and I'm slowly learning, and that's the thing, I'm learning as I go. And that's kind of part of the theme of this video. I feel like a lot of folks are afraid to really try their hands at fixing stuff because they think, leave it to a professional or I don't know where to start. And uh, you know, this tool right here, for example, the Dremel, <laughs> Everybody knows the Dremel. Uh, this is a Roto Flex, in case you're curious. This goes on the front of the Dremel to allow you to carve like a pencil. And uh, yes, this is why a Dremel would be daunting to most people. <laughs> so many different bits. Where do you use what? There's wire brushes, there's sanding discs, there's polishing discs. And even up till recent, I didn't even know how to use the polishing compound. I thought it was actually too hard that it was old because it was so hard, but you actually have to you know, spin the the bit inside it to, to warm it up, to thin it out. At any rate, we're always all learning. I've been a carpenter for half my life and I'm still learning how some of these tools work and some of the beneficial bits and tips and how to properly use them. And the reason I mentioned the Dremel is because it's probably going to be one of the most useful tools for restoring any type of old tools. Um, I'd like to show you the knife, I guess, first of all. Now this knife was my grandfather's, as I said. It was one of the only things I have from him that uh, I also had a 32 pistol that he took off a dead German soldier, apparently. And uh, someone stole that from my house decades ago. So uh, this was the only, I guess, real weapon I had. But... Uh, this is an RH-34. Let me see if I can focus in here. It's an RH-34 knife by PAL, or PAL is what they called it. Uh, I can't recall the company that made them. And uh, as you can see, it's a nice shiny blade, but of course it's got some pitting. Now, mind you, if you saw what this looked like before, uh, it was horrendously rusted and old and pitted and, and just, it was just horrendous. <laughs> Um, and this has been restored probably three or four times over the past 30 years by me as I learned and got more skills in what the hell I'm doing. And it was one of those things where you don't want to mess something up by screwing around and that's how, for example, trying to clean out this pitted area in here, I ended up scraping too much off. I could have fixed all that. I'm not looking for perfection. I'm not looking for, you know, a beautiful... Mercedes of knives. I'm looking for something that's functional, that's clean, and that works. And uh, so I'm going to tell you that this, the reason why people go for these vintage tools and vintage knives is because they were built quality. I mean, this is a quality knife, and it has to be. This was meant for going into battle, and uh, you know, you want something reliable. This is a full tang knife. This morning it was pretty, it was it was somewhat clean, but not this polished. And what I did to get it that polished was very simple. I just used some sandpaper, not this one, but this is a 320. I have a 600 grit sandpaper, and then I went from that to like a 2000 grit. And after that I polished it using one of these Dremel polishing wheels. But you don't even need that. I mean, if you have a standard bench grinder or anything like that, uh, you know, this is the wheel I use to do some of the finish work, because I also do stone work, and that's how I polish down, like, pieces of jade. Like, to take a piece of raw jasper and turn it into that, you've got to have a polishing method. But what I'm going to say here is you don't need any of that shit. You don't need any of it. All you need is some sandpaper, some elbow grease, and a polishing cloth with some compound. You could use any type of polishing compound. One of my favorites is cerium oxide. C-E-R-I-U-M. It's the stuff they use to polish glass, and I use that for doing stone work. But uh, any, at any rate, tools really aren't the main focus here, but I just wanted to bring that up because there are so many different options for tools that you can use for doing things like this.
So this knife, what I also did, uh-oh, the neighbors are attacking. The neighbor dogs are attacking, and my dog's over there trying to attack the, uh, <laughs> the birds in the trees. So this was the other issue with the knife. Okay, so it has, it has a really nice steel. It has a full tang, which means a full handle that goes through. And this is the pommel. And a pommel is just the part that goes on the end. You can see there's a little, um, right here, there's a little dot, and that's where they, you know, sanded it off flush, and I'm speaking in layman terms here. But um, this was the interesting part, because this was really thrashed. I started sanding it down. I believe, in the past, I thought this was maybe made of leather sections, but I found out that it's actually wood. So all of these little stripes are individual pieces of wood, I believe. And then the ones on the end here, these three, the at least the, the red, and then the yellows, and then the other two blacks around it, you can see it's a darker black. Those are plastic. I'm not sure what kind, because it was made in the 40s. But at any rate, I polished that as much as I could, and it kept bringing up fibers. So I went to my second favorite remodel tool, which is CA glue. CA glue is going to be your best friend for fixing things uh, that are, you know, damaged with wood. I mean, this is super thin super glue. This is basically the kind of stuff you do not want to mistake for nasal spray. So uh, I dumped a bunch of that on there and let it dry, and then I sanded it down again. And then I went over it with some shellac, actually. Bullseye shellac. And uh, that's enough. I know people, I just did one coat. And I know some folks may think, oh, you have to use a special coat or make it super durable. Do you? Really? How often are you going to hold your knife? I mean, if you're the kind of person who's out there carving shit every day with a knife this big, then, hey, for all, you know, for all it's worth, do whatever you've got to do to your handle. But it's really about just a basic coating to protect it over time. The only thing I really had to modify was this little crack right here, which had formed over decades of shrinkage in the wood. And that left this little area where the finger guard was actually loose and flopping around. And so what I did was I stretched a piece of, uh, like a quarter inch piece of leather in there, like just basically a piece of this stuff. Stretched it around really tight, threw some CA glue on there, and uh, I said it's good to go. So this is my knife restoration, and I'm pretty stoked on it because it's sharp, it's shiny, and I feel like I've done justice to my grandfather's. Uh, you know, the fact that he brought this back, and so this little sheath I've got for it is not the greatest, but uh, it's tight. Let's just put it that way. Let's see if I can get it in there by one hand. There we go. Chink, chink. At any rate, it's a it's a great knife. I think it's in there now. <laughs> I need to improve upon my methods here. It's a great little knife, and uh, now it's not just going to sit on a shelf. It can actually be utilized and carried on my belt. Another thing soldiers get besides knives and guns is a, a coin. So, you know, if you join the military and you go fight overseas, they'll give you a thank you coin. I mean, what else could you ask for, right? And this right here is something that I restored recently, which is not finished yet, obviously. Uh, this took on more rust because I hadn't finished it yet. I got it sanded down a ways. But the thing is, if you're going to finish metal, I want to make this point. You need to oil your metal to protect it, and if you, before you do that, you want to sand it down as smooth as you can. So you start out with like, you know, 600 grit, and then go to 1000 grit, 2000 grit, sandpaper. Get it really smooth, and then polish it on any kind of polishing wheel. Because what that's going to do is it's going to get rid of those little divots that are in the, in the uh, metal from oxida oxidation over time. And then you oil it, and it will prevent further rusting. I don't recall where I got this, perhaps at a garage sale or something. I really love it. It's a Stanley Bailey number 4 plane. Um, in case you don't know woodworking, a hand plane is very simple. It has a blade that comes out the bottom at an angle. You can adjust it for depth, and you just push it along, and it just cuts up pieces off of the top and flattens out your surface. And before you go say something like this is irrelevant because of planers and jointers, no, dude. <laughs> a lot of woodworkers still use a standard plane. They are amazing tools. But when I restored this, I only got partially done, but I got the blade all sharpened and everything, and this handle was totally busted. So I made a new one out of a piece of 
Paduke, which is a reddish wood, and I've been using it so much it's dark now, but you can see the corner broke off down here. Um, pointing this out because it's a restoration project that kind of went bad. Not bad, but rather, I guess, after a decade of <laughs> using it on and off, it finally broke and I need a new one. Um, the types of wood you choose for restoring things is important, too. Um, just before I started this video, I was getting ready to... Uh, I was going to do some fret work. I was restoring, actually, an old guitar and also building my own. This is my rosewood fretboard and my uh, zebra wood neck. I was going to put that all together, and so I'm going back and forth as some of the tools that I use end up needing to be restored. This right here, I just sanded down the top of it. You can see it's kind of shiny before. It was pretty rusty, but I think it's a, a value vise. I'm not sure. I can't read it anymore, but it's an old vise that I... Basically, the reason I have this in here like that is because I was making sure they didn't stick together. I just put... I restored it a little bit and just put new leather pads on there. But something like that is actually a very valuable, you know, uh, benefit in the shop, having a small vise like that. And I had this old Vietnam-era anti-aircraft artillery shell uh, that I just got at a garage sale free, uh, along with that Dremel. Actually, this was in a box with a bunch of bits, and it was all just free. I was going to put it in the vise, and uh, I spun it around to show you that, you know, that's just a... 30 seconds of polishing and how quickly you can restore anything metal to its former glory if you're willing to take the time whatever it may be and uh, I think there are vast benefits to fixing old items because the quality of materials was always better and that's not to say that they don't have high quality materials today on a lot of products you can get them sure but you're gonna pay a lot more they're considered premium items, and back then it wasn't like that. The only companies making products were competing to make the best products. It's like the Stereo Wars in the 70s. I'm a stereo guy, and there was the Stereo Wars, as they call them, where the different companies like Pioneer and Marantz and Sansui were all competing for, uh, you know, profit shares in the market, and so they were willing to make their receivers with very little overhead or very little profit. Uh, and a very high overhead, rather. So the components were just packed into these stereos, but, uh, uh, you know, they weren't making a whole lot, but they were hoping they'd get their name out there. They were still making good money, and that's what we've lost in the modern day. Businesses aren't looking to make a product that people talk about or people want to, you know, use for life, but rather something where it's going to fall apart and you're going to have to buy another one. It's planned obsolescence, and it's unfortunate, but that's why somebody's willing to restore a beat-up old World War II era knife, because the steel in this blade is probably better than 99% of the shit you're going to get on the market today. And so that's my thought on restoring vintage stuff. It's always worth it, even if it's a clamp. You'd be surprised what some of the stuff is worth, so next time you're at a garage sale and you come across an old rusty tool, think about the metal that's in it. There are, there are a lot of people looking for that kind of, you know, quality metal. You just can't find it anymore. Alright, I'm off to make a traditional Japanese sword. I'll see you in two years.